Good afternoon. Hope everybody's enjoying the beautiful day, the beautiful weather. <laughs> Summer was just here the other day. What happened to it? It's just departed. Um, my name's Stephen Sheeler. I am the former managing director for uh, Facebook in Australia and New Zealand, and that's probably the reason why I'm standing here today. I want to talk to you all a bit about this whole era of digital disruption we're going through and give you kind of my take on what's been going on. I talk, I talk about it as being sort of disruptopia. You know, we all feel this sense of disruption these days, and sometimes a little hard to pin down exactly what's going on, but I want to talk a bit about what's going on and, and what you might be able to do about it um, in your own businesses and in your own professional life. Just before I start, I've got a slide up here. This is me on the stage of the ICC, just down right there. Um, back in June, I was lucky enough to do TEDx here in Sydney, the biggest TEDx in the world. So when you walk out onto that stage, there's 5,000 people 5,000, 10,000 ears, 10,000 eyeballs, and dead silence. Ever since then, I've found it so easy to walk out onto a stage. I'm so relaxed. Um, but TEDx was a, a real bucket list experience for me. So let me just uh, take you through a few things. I'm just going to start off by um, just talking a little bit about Facebook. I'll talk a little bit about Facebook today. Somebody said, you know, to prove that I worked for Facebook, put up a photo of me and Mark. So here's the photo of me and Mark. Um, this is from us back in around 2012 when I first joined the business. And you can see Cheryl over on the left-hand side. I'll tell you a couple quick things about Mark. One is he is smarter than almost everybody in the room. Um, he's probably the smartest person I've ever met. People who know him much better than me say he is a bona fide genius. Uh, and you can kind of tell it with Mark. He's kind of looking five or ten steps ahead. So whenever you go to talk to Mark about anything, he has an annoying habit of kind of going to your last point before you even get to it. Uh, and then he goes to a few points beyond that, which is a really hard thing when you want to go talk to Mark because you know he's just going to interrupt you no matter what you're going to say. It can be very frustrating. And the second thing about Mark is he, does, he is very kind of um, clammy. He's very sweaty. So uh, anytime you shake his hand, it's very kind of, you, you can see why he doesn't wear a lot of suits. He likes to stay cool. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about Mark when we do the Q&A if you want to talk to him in more detail. This is what I do today. I spend my time on these sorts of stages or with CEOs, business leaders, boards, the federal government, all around this question of digital disruption and trying to get Australia up the league table, particularly in how, in how business is confronting digital technologies. I think consumers have no problem in this country. We are very adaptive and very quick to take up new technologies. Um, but government and business are probably much further behind than we need to be, and we need to get that up. So by 2030, I want to see Australia in the top five, if not the top three in the world in terms of the digital economies on the face of the planet. I do this through a number of ways. I have a little firm of my own called the Digital CEO, where I try to, we, we try to build digital leaders. I do this in conjunction with also with McKinsey and the AGSM, where I work as an advisor and an, an entrepreneur in residence, respectively. And when I left Facebook, um, I kind of retired, and I was going to take a lot of time off, so I took about a year off. And then the phone started ringing, and I started thinking about what should be my purpose in life, and I came up with this purpose to try to, uh, to advance Australia's digital capabilities over the next few years, because I think I'm, I'm kind of uniquely in a position to do that. And the three things we, I focus on up here, the truth is I, I kind of thought most of it would be on the left side, the digital strategy and execution, the hard stuff. But probably more than 50% of my conversations with CEOs and boards and leaders is around the soft stuff on the, on the right-hand side, the digital leadership, the talent, the cultures that we build, the way we change ourselves as leaders. And, and luckily, I've been through a bit of that process in myself at Facebook, so I kind of try to bring those insights to the leaders I deal with to every day. These are some of the businesses that I work with, just to give you a flavor. Um, so I just want to level set right now. I want to talk a little bit about digital disruption and how we're all feeling it. And I just want to define first what is digital, just so we're on the same page. This is how we talk about it at Facebook. It's these three things, and it's how they apply to four different areas. The first is the products and services that we sell every day. This is particularly around things like e-commerce, digitizing the products and services we have. The second is the assets inside of our business. This is where the things like the Internet of Things comes in, where we put sensors into everything, where we can measure how the assets are performing in our business. The third is the operations of our business and how we move things around and how we digitize all those operations. And then finally, we shouldn't forget the workforce, how we digitize how people work independently or with other people and also how they work with machines. And increasingly, how we work machi with machines is going to be the key differentiator between success and failure, failure in the future because we are going to work much more closely with machines every single day. 
So that's what I talk about in terms of digital. Now, what does disruptive mean? Disruptive is really pretty simple. At Facebook, we would just call it very effing fast and very effing powerful. It, it just, you just know it when you feel it, right? I don't have an empirical definition of it, but we all kind of know it. And probably in some industries here, maybe there's less that feeling, but I'd say in almost every industry, we're starting to feel it. And I was, in Facebook, we were in industry tech and media, which has felt it's, it's like crazy in the past couple of years. And let me tell you a couple of stories then about that world of sort of tech and media. This is a little thing that happened basically last year, right here in, right here in Sydney. Channel 10 ran into some trouble and went into uh, receivership. And it was eventually, eventually bought out of receivership by CBS. And around the time that it went bankrupt, that's uh, around the time that I, went, uh, I left Facebook, I got a phone call from a media billionaire. And it was not one of these on the screen. It was another one. But he, this was happening at the same time. And so we caught up for lunch. And sitting over lunch, we were talking about this a little bit, how these four billionaires had put a billion dollars into Channel 10 back in the 2012, thinking that free-to-air TV was a good idea. And these are smart people who make a lot of money, right? They're no, they're no dummies. But they had put that billion dollars in, and they'd toasted that money. It was gone by 2017. Basically, Channel 10 had run into a lot of problems. And part of their problem was caused by the likes of me, running Facebook and Google and Netflix. We had taken audiences and advertising dollar away from them in the billions of dollars. You know, Facebook alone, we had grown to being over a billion US dollar advertising business from a standing start in 2012. So that money had to come from somewhere. A lot of it came from the likes of Channel 10. And sitting there over that lunch, he, I was really struck by a couple of things I wanted to share with you. One was, I, I took out my phone at one point in time, and I was showing him something on Facebook on my phone. And we were chatting away, and he kind of leaned over, and he was smiling and looking, and he goes, you know, I've never looked at Facebook on a mobile phone. And I was like, you know, two billion people on Earth have managed to download Facebook <laughs> to their phone, and they don't have a billion dollars tied up in competing like Facebook with Facebook like you do. So how could you have not gotten to getting Facebook onto your phone? How could you? 14 million Australians every day go to Facebook on their mobile phone and check it out every single day. I just couldn't believe it. And I said, you know, I've lost a bit of my sympathy for you because you've lost your curiosity. And he admitted to me, he said, you know, you're right, I have this formula for success. It's worked for a long time, it's made me very successful, but now I kind of outsource pieces to other people, and I'm not as curious about things like technology and change as I used to be. I was really struck by that, and he was, he was very kind of thoughtful about that at that moment. And the second thing, and I asked him a little, I said, look, if I come to you just, say, three years ago, and I said, give me your list of your top ten competitors, where would Facebook have been on the list? And he said, you wouldn't have been in my top 100. He said, in fact, if I gave you my business plan, my strategic plan from three years ago, which is 120 pages long, Facebook's not even mentioned on one of those pages. And neither is Google, and neither is Netflix. Yet as we sat there having that lunch, Facebook, Google, and Netflix were his number one, number two, and number three biggest problems in some order, right? How his world had changed in just a few short years. Think about how many business plans we write today where the most disruptive competitor in your space may not even be in that plan if it's a five-year plan, particularly if it's a five-year plan. So that's what's happened. And five years that I was at Facebook, this is what happened in my world, growing Facebook, which really helped to disrupt the likes of Channel 10. We had 900 million people on Facebook, the core platform, back when I joined in 2012. This is a big number, right? 2004 is when Fa Mark started in his dorm room. 2012, we got to 900 million. But in the five years that I was there, we grew the, globally the platform to over 2 billion people. We then spun out Messenger and grew that to over a billion people. We bought WhatsApp and grew that to over a billion, and we actually bought Instagram as well, and that recently crossed a billion people just a couple months ago. So in that one measure alone, if you just measure it that way, and some of these are the same people on the same platform, but this is kind of a 5x increase in what was already a billion, essentially a billion user platform. And this is what was really hard for that media billionaire and those other media billionaires to understand and to see, was the disruption that was moving into their space so quickly. And this is why losing your curiosity can be such such a death knell if you're not curious every single day. Let me tell you another, another little story. I was with the board of one of Australia's biggest retailers. This happened a few months ago. And they were asking me all about uh, Amazon and, and um, how they compete with Amazon and what I thought about Amazon and you know, all, all that sort of stuff. And I have some pretty hard uh, points of view about Amazon. Um, I think Amazon's amazing. I don't think retail is completely dead, but I think there's a lot of problems that a retailer is going to face. Um, and my wife works for Amazon, so I have a little bit of inside knowledge occasionally. Um, but I asked them this question. Instead of them just telling me what I thought, I asked them some questions. So I said, 
how many people do you have working on artificial intelligence to support Alexa-style Alexa voice today? You know, what's your voice strategy? How many AI engineers do you have? You know, what, how many machine learning people do you have? I was really curious to know. And this is a big re Australian retailer. We're 30% market share. We all shop with them on a regular basis. And their answer was zero. We have nobody doing this, okay? Not one person. So you tried over to Amazon, how many people do they have doing this? There were over 2,000 people working on artificial intelligence. In fact, I think I read the other day that uh, they have more job openings just in Alexa today at Amazon than, than, uh, than our job openings in all of Google. That's how big voice is for Amazon. So this raises a couple of questions. Remember, I was with the board, right? So these are very smart, very successful people. But it raises a couple of questions, which I asked them, right? So the first question was, why did you make the decision that this was absolutely not an important problem to solve? That you wouldn't invest one penny in solving it? Why did you make that decision? What do you think their answer was? They didn't. They never made any decision. They never sat and thought about it. It never was something that came up in a board meeting. It was never even considered or discussed before. So then I asked the second question. Why did Amazon decide this was such an important problem to solve that they spent billions of dollars and like seven or eight years trying to solve it? And again, the board, they didn't really have an answer. And so I said, here's the answer, a Silicon Valley answer, which is friction. Amazon knows that as long as people are typing into phones and they're an e-commerce platform, there's only so big they can get. There's only so much stuff you're going to buy with your thumbs, right? There's only so much time you're going to spend ordering things with your thumbs. So they need to get to the next level of friction removal, which is not typing to computers, it's talking to computers. That's why they're doing it. That's why they've done all this. And what do you think the next level of friction removal is? It's reading your thoughts, right? And I guarantee you, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they all have teams, Apple, they all have teams sitting in some building that are working on the human-machine interface. I've seen the team at Facebook. So th every one of those businesses is working on that next level of friction removal. But for these guys, fricks, that way of thinking about their customers and the friction of actually shopping was not how they think about customer experience. They would think about the competitor across the street, we build our bricks and mortar, they build their bricks and mortar, and they just didn't think this way. So they have a real challenge on their hands. And doubly so because of things like this. As Warren Buffett would tell you, you just don't want to give them a head start. And that's unfortunately what you have done. Really hard to catch up now. Let me tell you a third um, little story. And this, I will talk about this, uh, this client. This is um, Qantas. Alan Joyce and his team are amazing. One of the best run airlines in the world. I love flying Qantas. I love being one of their you know, um, hopefully one of their best customers. And the great thing about Qantas is they're really open-minded. So when I sat with Alan and his leadership team, they were asking me, if Facebook or Google was running an airline, what would you do differently? So I was like, I love this question because I can say anything I want. I have no idea how hard it is to really <laughs> run an airline. And so I kind of focused on this question of friction. And what I said to Alan and his team was, how much do you know about how well people sleep on your planes? Because I would imagine for you guys, fun is sleep is probably the biggest single friction for a long haul airline, right? And all of us in the room feel it, right, in our bones. Even when I just said it, I could see a lot of heads nodding. And they came back and they said, well, you know, we give people surveys and we take the spiciness out of the food and we kind of put these flatbeds in business class. And I said, look, <laughs> with all due respect, <laughs> most people don't fly in first class with Neil Perry's, you know, silver service uh, caviar coming out. This is how most people travel. And it's a painful experience trying to sleep on a plane. So, I, and I was very brutal with him. I said, frankly then, you actually know nothing about how well people sleep. You have no data. Zero. And they was like, yeah, you, you're right. We actually have no data. I said, well, that's the difference between you and a digital native business, like a Facebook or a Google or a, an Apple or a, or a smaller startup that's focused on this issue of customer friction. What they would do is they would go and they would embed the cabin of the plane with sensors that are so sensitive they can measure the CO2 and the oxygen, the, 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 the dew point, the temperature, everything. Sensors that are so good that a sensor right here could measure how well you're sleeping right over there. And the truth is if those sensors don't exist, and they do exist because I have a little interest in a sensing business, so I actually know a bit about sensing, but they do exist. If they didn't exist, Facebook, Google, or Amazon would hire Scientists stick them in a room or stick them in a building and they would invent this technology because it's too important a problem to solve. You can't simply say, oh no, we can't solve it. To their credit, Alan left the room and he said, you're right, we have to start to solve this problem. So they've embarked on trying to figure out what's the state of sensing technology, 
what data can they gather, and can they use that data to make themselves not just the world's best sleeping, best, um, safest airline, but the world's best sleeping airline, which would be even better. And then think about what else they could do with that data. An airline has more people sleeping in a controlled environment than any other type of business in the world. Probably they're not. Maybe a hotel would be the exception. And so if you can collect that data, what, do you, what could you do with it? Well, it might be useful in another industry that's called sleep science. Airlines are notoriously unprofitable. Sleep science is a booming industry. You might make more money out of sleep science than you do out actually running an airline. So now they're trying to figure that out as well. So that was a great example of how, you know, kind of you know, thinking differently about being customer obsessed, not just customer centric, which Qantas is, but customer obsessed, not allowing, you know, hey, it's not, it's not good enough to say we don't understand the answer to that question. And here's a third little, a fourth little vignette. Imagine this, a business like this. It's got amazing data, and it's got an unhuge swaths of the population, right? 20% of households, 20% of business. I mean, this is big. This is data that even Facebook or Amazon or Google would drool over. And it's got it on this kind of level of specificity, down to the kind of stuff you buy, your credit rating, exactly what you buy, how much uh, money you owe, how good you are paying back that money, you know, what your name is, how many kids you got, your cars, everything, right? You can imagine what kind of business has this data. But if I asked you this question, you had this kind of data, and this kind of number of people, how many things would you choose to sell to these customers? How many different types of things? If you sat on that kind of unbelievable data, you go over to a bank, like a bank sit on this kind of data in this country, particularly, huge swaths, what's their answer? One thing, money, in a few different forms, right? Money, they've been branding money for 200 years. You go to this guy, what's his answer? Everything, right? I'm gonna sell you everything. Suddenly you got a problem. A few years ago, I mean, just, just literally like three years ago, if I was talking to the banks, the senior leaders at the banks, and I, I, our banks are so well run in this country, it is, I think they're amazingly well run business, but some of the senior leaders, they would think that Facebook was for their kids, that Amazon sold books, you know, they had no idea the disruption that was happening in their world. They have turned it around, and, and recently they're all, you know, going, working like crazy on what's our strategy around competing or partnering with the tech giants. You know, what are we going to do in terms of our agile transformations? You know, they have really gotten their game together. But they have come late to that game, and hopefully they can keep up. Because they've got another problem here, which is the customers have started to answer the question, this question, in a way that banks don't want to hear. This is a survey from the U.S. done recently. 55% of people said, no problem. I would buy my home loan from Google. I would get a credit card from Amazon. I would get a deposit account with Facebook. Not a problem. So this is a real problem for banks, and the banks are now starting to confront it. So what's my point about all this, right? The point is that the game has changed. I think the game of business has fundamentally changed just in the past few years. And let me just capture this from a historical perspective. Back in the 19th century, this is how business was run, right? It was about standardization and mechanization and making sure every, you could produce a million widgets that were exactly the same and then ship them all over the country at a low price, right? That's, if it was, you know, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. That was the way the economy was set up. That's when business, that's when capitalism was essentially invented. And that's when we, invent, when we invented everything like that we have today about the processes, systems, structures, about how we run business. Everything from the five-day work week to the monthly board meetings to the quarterly reporting, you know, to the ways we structure, even the titles we have for our roles in businesses and, and all the theories about how you run a business were basically put in place in the 19th century. And then you get through the 20th century, it got a little shinier, but essentially it was still the same structure, processes, and systems, and they, said, they held us in good stead. But you get to today, and things are very different. This is an open plan office. It, many of you may work in open plan offices today, but it sort of exemplifies this knowledge economy that we live in, this economy of ideas, this, uh, you know, this fourth industrial revolution we're now going through. And this is actually one of Facebook's offices in Silicon Valley. When Facebook moved into its, uh, its campus, where it is today, there were 19 buildings already there. It retrofitted those, camp those 19, and it built, this is the first new building that Mark Zuckerberg designed and built himself. It's called Building 20, very original title. And it's the world's largest open plan office. It's a big, it's about a kilometer long box. And it's got about 3,000 engineers and developers all brought in there, ar arrayed around Mark. It's all his core development teams. It's exactly what he wants. He's in the same stand-up desk as everybody else. That might be Mark there, in fact. He's at the same stand-up desk as everybody else. And it really just exemplifies the way business has changed um, in the 21st century. And you know, if you go to Silicon Valley today, or if you go to a, any sort of tech business hub in the world, 
what don't you see? You don't see smokestacks, right? You don't see delivery. You don't see big trucks driving in and out, you know, driving away with goods. You just stand outside Facebook and you, you hear silence. You hear air conditioners. There's servers. It's just silent. We live in this knowledge economy where the value is being created in this way. Yet we're still running a lot of our companies the way as if it was the 19th century. So that's a big problem. So digital, I think, changes five things. This whole digital revolution, I think, changes five things profoundly. And I just want to double click on each one quickly just to go a little deeper. Let's talk about the speed element, which we touched on a minute ago. But let's just go a little deeper on this one. This is amazing. This was amazing when I first saw this. I really loved this. This is how long it took to get to 50 million users of each one of these types of technologies. For those of you who are younger in the crowd, on the left-hand side is a radio and a TV. Um, and on the other side is, you know, st is stuff that you use every day. So how many years did it get to 50 million users for, for radio? It took 40 years to get to 50 million radios on the face of the earth. It took 14 years to get to 50 million TVs. It took four years to get to 50 million Facebook accounts between 2003 and 2007. It took four months to get to 50 million WeChat accounts. Now, not only is this fast, but think about the implications. Let's just take one, uh, one perspective on that. Let's say your job back in the day was consumer marketing. You worked for a big CPG company. Your job was, uh, your job was marketing and advertising. If you grew up in the era, and your, your career was in the era of TV and radio, you had your whole career to figure out the winning formula for TV or radio. And then you just reapplied that formula for the rest of your career. Probably even more realistically, when you came into the business at 21, you learned a certain formula, here's how we win here, kid. And then by the time you retired at 55, it was the same formula. Nothing had really changed. And that's the way business has run for a long time. But if you live in this era of WeChat in four months, guess what? Your competitive dynamics, the whole industry can change literally between board meetings and certainly between annual reports. So this is the world we're living in, and it's not just happening in communication technologies. It's happening in industry after industry now being broken down by these global platforms, and the, pro the, the proliferation of technology that we're getting today is happening faster than ever before. Now, the second thing is boundaries. We kind of think of our businesses as having boundaries around them where we know who our competitors are. And we have industries where we think, you know, Kohl's thinks Woolies is our competitor, and one bank thinks that bank's our competitor. You, you know, we always we have our competitive sets. But the truth is, those boundaries are really starting to break down as well. And here's a great way to think about that. And everybody in the room will feel it themselves. Now, before I answer this question, I have a question for you. How many people in the room are Netflix subscribers? Put your hand up. OK. Now, how many are not Netflix subscribers? It's like four of you. Maybe five. OK. So Netflix has like a couple more months to go before they mop up 100%. So they've got a little more work to do. You want your Netflix free. You, you want them to pay you to use Netflix. You can hold out so the price gets really low. There's not enough content on Netflix. Um, so this question was asked of somebody back in 2010. Now he gave, unfortunately he gave the wrong answer, and he gave it in a uh, very public forum. It was Jeffrey Bukes, who was the CEO of Time Warner, one of the biggest and most venerable media companies in the world, and recently in the news because they're, they're merging or been acquired by AT&T in this whole battle that's going on media. Jeff Bukes, his answer to this question when he was asked, is Netflix a threat, was very dismissive back in 2010. He couldn't care less. You know, Albania, do they have an army? These guys are a pipsqueak. We are Time Warner. Well, let's see what's happened in the interim. What's happened to his boundaries? Time Warner was a pretty big business back in 2010. You know, it's grown to still be a pretty big business, about 80 billion, I think, with the acquisition by AT&T. It's not too bad. What's happened over at uh, in the Albanian army, Netflix? who were a pipsqueak back in 2010, only 3 billion market cap. And why were they so small? Their business model was sending DVDs to people in the mail. That's what they did. Anybody who's been involved in a mail order business, it's, it can be pretty low tech, right? You, get this, you shove things in envelopes and you get it out the door. That was their business. They never produced any content. But what's happened? 50x. They're double the size of Time Warner today. And you see it right here in this room. How many of us had even heard of Netflix just three or four years ago? Probably almost none of us had. Suddenly, I'd say, I'd say that Netflix has about 85, 90% penetration of this room alone. So that's what I mean about the boundaries being broken down. This year, Netflix is going to spend about $8 billion on original content for its platform. It's going to produce over 88 feature films. I think it has over 700 original pieces of content now on Netflix alone. The next biggest Hollywood studio will do about 26 feature films. That's Disney. So Netflix 
has been doing this for eight years, and they're the biggest in the world. Hollywood's been doing this for 100 years. So Netflix has come from nowhere. This is what I mean about, about how boundaries are breaking down. Let's talk about the third thing that's changing on the digital onslaught. It's fuel, the fuel that we use to fuel our businesses. And you probably heard a bit about this today, and we're all thinking about it. The, the, the big fuel we've got today, the big change in fuel is data, right? There's lots of other things we need. We need money, we need capital, we need people, we need assets. But data is the big thing. And I talk about data as being the new opals, not, not the new oil. oil. There's two reasons for this. One is we're here in Australia, so we need an Australian example. Um, but the second is I think it's genuinely true that data is now becoming more like opals. And let me explain why. If you go to the, um, the opal fields of Cooper Pedy or Lightning Ridge, and you look out over them, this is exactly what you see. You see holes everywhere. Because looking for opals is non, very non-predictive. You just know generally where they are, but yet, yes, you have to dig down. Well, data is not a kind, of, kind of the same way. This being able to store and process and keep data and collect data is so unbelievably cheap. Collecting data, there's no reason, reason to have just a business case to collect data. You just collect everything you possibly can. And then you get some smart people and some smart AI to start digging. And it starts figuring out where is the value. That's the way data has become. And this is a sad fact, that most companies actually don't collect a lot of data on their customers, let alone other parts of their business, like we talked about before, the assets and the operations and the workforce. They don't collect a lot of data on the customer, and they don't use what they already have. Most businesses are not very, they're not very well armed in, for this new data war that we're entering today. They actually don't even have the weaponry. So collecting data is super important. And this is the second reason it's super important, particularly for customer-facing companies, customer-facing businesses, is because we don't even understand the data we have, and we, or we don't have the data that's going to create the future value for the customers that we either have today or the future customers we're going to attract. So data is really this new battleground, and I cannot emphasize enough how important data and analytics and AI are going to be to, be to the future of business. This is why it is such a big deal. Don't you like how I made that big, big thing go? I did that on PowerPoint myself. I found, that little, I found that little feature in the animation. It's a big deal. And these are the four things that are going on that make it a big deal. So the computing power is now better than ever. The quantity that we're spitting off from every device on Earth, from every sensor on Earth, from the Internet, everywhere, is bigger than ever. We've got cheap storage to store it in the cloud. You can get it from Amazon, Google, um, you know, uh, Len Lenovo, IBM. They've all got their cloud businesses now. And then we've got, we sprinkle the machine learning on top. And then just in the past five years, machine learning has made huge strides because the computing power is better and because the quantity of data is so great that machine learning thrives on. And smart mathematicians have started to figure stuff out for us. So when you start to do that, you start to figure out there's all kinds of use cases for machine learning when you have this data. And these use cases can be incredibly high value. I did a piece of work with McKinsey where we looked at the, the use cases for machine learning. And this is just one graph. I hate using graphs when I have, do presentations. But this is one I tossed in. Because it kind of shows what the value of these, these use cases are and where they kind of sit. Pri at McKinsey, we had so this way of sort of ranking the, the prioritization of these in terms of the volume of the data and the impact that was, that was given by the, the uh, executives in those industries. And I j we've just labeled a few of them up there. But you start to see, for example, up in the top right-hand corner, that's fa Facebook, right? That's personalized advertising. That's, it's no coincidence Facebook grew so, grew so quickly because it's been essentially one of the first AI businesses in the world and it applied it's one of the highest value use cases, which was advertising, which traditionally is not personalized at all. Everybody sees the same ad whether you need that product or not. It's super inefficient. So that's what Facebook has taken advantage of. But every business on earth needs to start thinking about this. What's, where, what's the highest value use cases in my business for applying AI and start to figure that out? See, that's the new data, that's the new, that's the new fuel we need to fuel our businesses. The fourth one is culture. I just have one slide on this. And this is a, a, a slide from a manifesto, a group called the, the Agile Movement in Silicon Valley. And they actually had a manifesto a few years ago. We all know about the Agile all banks and other businesses becoming Agile. And this is a single page from it. Because they wrote down, you know, what's Agile and what's na not Agile. And I think this captures well the difference between the 21st and the 19th century. And I'll just call out a couple of things here. Those two um, acronyms, MVP, Minimal Viable Product, a software development concept, particularly born of, of uh, mobile development when you have to build an app for a phone. You need to get to one thing that app can do really well. You can't have 55 things that one app does because 55 things is, is 54 too many. You need to do one really well. So the idea of MVP is just get that built, get it into people's hands and see how they use it and then iterate. And ABM is a Facebook thing. It stands for always be making. And it's a counterbalance to having too much data. If you've got a lot of data, you, 
and your and your big AI type business, big data analytics business like Facebook is, the risk is you become paralyzed by analysis because you're always chasing better data. And so Facebook, we, Facebook says, well, we're a culture of builders. We build stuff. We don't just analyze. Facebook won't talk themse about themselves as being analysts or AI, or AI. They're talking about themselves as being builders. And the reason is you always want to be making something. You don't want to just be analyzing because the best data ultimately is data that comes from your customers using a product or service. So you're always making. And now the final thing, the talent that we have in our business and how that's changing. And I have two points here. So one is this. This guy was unemployable back when he was doing his stuff. Now, if anybody in the room doesn't know who this is, you can come to me later and, uh, and we can have a chat. But thank God for academia because he lost his job at the Swiss um, patent office and had to go and get a job in academia. Academia took in Einstein. And if they didn't, he would have lived under a bridge and we would probably all be living under the bridge, a bridge ourselves or in the caves ourselves. Nuclear power probably wouldn't have been invented, at least not when it was. So Einstein was an amazing guy. But you know what? Einstein probably wouldn't want to work for most of the kind of companies that we work for today. Right? He, he's attracted by different things. He or she. He or she wants to have sort of different types of people to work with, different environment. May want a different career path. May not want to manage anybody. Think about how many businesses we work for where the only career path is you have to manage more people. That's how you advance. You manage 10 people. You manage 50 people. You manage 100 people. That's how you go up. But the truth is people like this don't want to manage anybody sometimes. And so at Facebook and Google and at Amazon and Apple, there's another career path. It's called the individual contributor path at Facebook. It's slightly different names than the others. IC, we call it. There's a manager path and there's IC. And if you come into Facebook and if you want to, you want to go through the IC path and you're smashing it and you're bringing value to the company, you can advance at the same rate as somebody who's managing 100, 1,000, you know, 10,000 people and still get paid the same, promoted the same, the same level, et cetera. And a lot of our businesses don't work that way. So we really need to think about how we attract and bring in this kind of talent to apply to that data that we're supposed to be collecting. And the second thing is youth. I cannot emphasize enough, we have too many jobs in our businesses where the bias is towards experience and credentials when that is not the best in indicator of the impact that person will drive when we bring them to that role. Now make no mistake, I don't think this applies to all jobs. If somebody's going to operate on my brain, uh, I want a brain surgeon who's been doing it for 20 years. I don't want somebody who's just enthusiastic about, you know, my cranium. Uh, but when it comes to certain types of roles, particularly those sort of creative roles or those sorts of technical roles, really think hard about how do you even write a, write a job ad? Is the first line of the job ad 10 years experience or five years experience? Because even at Facebook, we started to look closely at that and we would eliminate that sort of thing in a job ad. Because we realized if, if you, as soon as you do that, it narrows the aperture on the talent that you can actually bring in and start talking to because youth can have a huge impact. And I just want to give you a little story from Facebook about how youth actually made that impact. For those of you who might remember a few years back, this is how Facebook used to look. And this isn't that long ago. This is sort of 10 years ago or so. Facebook was a big, ugly, um, desktop-based, reverse chronological bulletin board. And reverse chronological basically, basically means it was the most recent post from a friend would appear the first in your, on your wall, right? That would be just what, it was only sorted by chronology, right? And that is not a very engaging way for people to process stuff going on in that world. What's most recent is not necessarily the most relevant, but it's just an easy thing to do. And that's what Facebook did. Now we come to, um, we come forward to about two, 2006. I'm just gonna go back to 2000. 2006, we started to run into a problem. And this guy, I wanted to put up a photograph because he started to help us solve that problem. He was graduating from high school just back in 2000. So he was in Indiana, finishing high school, very smart kid. He went on to Stanford. He wound up doing a master's degree in artificial intelligence, machine learning. Back when that was like a weird thing. Nobody knew what it was. It was very fringy. In 2006, he was coming out of Stanford. And his, his roommate came home and said, hey, do you want a job at this new startup? It's called Facebook. Nobody had heard of Facebook. It was, Mark was not a famous person. And, and um, so he went down and he met with Facebook. And he came back and he said, uh, you know, I don't want to work there. It's a dating site. You know, I'm a scientist. Why would I want to work at a dating site? Facebook was known for how you hook up with girls back in those days. So we had a second meeting, which was Mark Zuckerberg. And Mark said, told him all about his vision for, for Facebook. And he convinced this guy, this guy's name's Chris Cox, that Facebook was not a dating site. It was going to change the world. So Chris was the first person Facebook ever hired who had any machine learning background. And he came into the business and he realized that we had something that was super valuable which was called authentic identity. One of Facebook's big, the big thing that Facebook's got is it knows who you are. 
That was the big starting point. Was, Mark almost stumbled into it. People tell, tell us all about who they are authentically on the platform. Think about TV, which is another media, mass media. TV has no idea who you are. No idea. Now, TV's been successful n not knowing anything about you, but if you know who you are, if, 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 if we can tell an advertiser or we can tell other people who you are, we have a huge power to be able to serve you exactly the kind of content that's relevant to you. That's why everybody's Facebook feed today is different. But in 2006, we realized, and Chris helped us realize, that authentic identity is not enough because we weren't good at answering this question. When people came to Facebook, they wanted to know what's going on in my world. But, we, but that reverse chronological bulletin board was not a very good way of answering that question. And so he helped us figure out this. How do you get from the 2,000 stories that you're sort of eligible at any one moment from all your friends and the things you like in Facebook to the 200 that you're going to have the time to look at? That's the average number that people might look at in a day. So how do we get to the right 200? And how do we rank them? What should be the first one? What should be the second one? What should be the third? And how should we do that at every time you come into Facebook, which at, at that time, the average was 14 times a day? This is a really hard problem to solve across hundreds of millions of users. But Chris helped us figure it out. And he figured it out because the answer was relevance. It was trying to figure out what's the most relevant content to you versus you versus you versus you at any one moment when you happen to come to the platform. This is what Chris did. He put together authentic identity with relevance to create the algorithm that sits behind Facebook's newsfeed. And this, many people would argue, is the most valuable invention in history. It is what Facebook is today. It's where you spend 99% of your time in Facebook. And it was invented by Chris Cox, who came out of Stanford as a 23-year-old, and two other people who are no more than 25 years old. Three people, no more than 25, invented the algorithm that is today Facebook's newsfeed. Chris is still with Facebook, and he's the head of product for Facebook. He's 36 years old now, so getting a little long in the tooth. But the reason I always emphasize that is this is the power that you can drive in your business. You have no idea sometimes the quality of people that you can bring in if you're just looking at CVs and experience. So today, luckily through the work of Chris and others, Facebook is this kind of personal daily newspaper for 1.3 billion humans. Facebook's an amazing thing, and it's got, does great things, and also has a lot of challenges. But I want to shift gears a little bit here. I just want to bring it home by saying, what does all this tell us about leadership? You being a leader, me being a leader, Mark Zuckerberg being a leader. How do we build better leaders in this new crazy digital world? And what we knew at Facebook was this. What got us to the base of the mountain in terms of 19th century ways of doing things was not going to get us to the top. We needed to think of different ways of building culture and building leaders in our business. And I just want to share with you a little bit about how we thought about that. We had this way of thinking about the core elements of leadership in Facebook. We call them the eight elements of leadership. And these are them. Now, leaders have to do a lot of other stuff. There's actually tons of things leaders have to do. You have to be a good communicator. You have to be good with people. You have to be good at strategy. You have to be good at financials and numbers, as, you know, operations, you name it. But we kind of boil it down to figuring out that these actually were the eight things that really mattered to make leaders for the 21st century not just the 19th century. And so these are the ones we would focus on. Now, I do a whole one-day, two-day, three-day master class for senior leaders on this, these eight elements. But here I'm just going to double-click on a couple because we've only got a few minutes left. So I just want to talk a little bit about that speed element again and just what practically how we think about it at Facebook. And we think about it as this. It's the ability to move faster than seemingly required. If you've ever talked to a sprinter, if you've had the opportunity to speak to sort of a, a, a a really high quality, you know, Olympic caliber sprinter or national champion sprinter, you will learn that their personal best is never good enough. Their personal best is only their PB. They can always push it to another level. Even a world champion, even Usain Bolt will say, I'm never fast enough. And this is something that the, the best businesses in the world, I think, build into their DNA, this sense of speed. And another way to think about it is this. Time is a fixed resource. We all get the same amount of time. Every competitor that you compete with has the same amount of time. There's no machine you can buy that gives you more time. But speed is a learned skill. It's how quickly you use that time. And too many of us, I think, again, from the 19th century, we, we're sort of lazy about how we use this scarce resource, and we're not tight enough about how we use it. So at Facebook, we do a few things. One is we tell everybody in the business, and we drill it into our culture. It's one of our five core values to focus on impact. And, we, and you focus on the impact along the journey of Facebook's mission, which is to make the world more open and connected and give people the power to share. That's Facebook's mission. And so we tell everybody who comes into our business, your job is, is to help us along that path. And anything that's not impactful on that path, you do not have to do. You should not be doing. You should not be spending any time on. 
Any, you should only be spending time times that are impact, on things that are impactful. So I'll give you an example of how that works practically. Every meeting in Facebook is voluntary. There's no mandatory meetings. So even if I call a, leadership, uh, a, a meeting of my leadership team, my leadership team does not have to come to that meeting. My direct reports. And sometimes they would not come to my meetings. Why? Because they had more important things to do. They had things that they thought were more impactful. And sometimes they would give me feedback and tell me that, hey, I came to your meeting and I thought it was a waste of time. Now imagine that. If you had to actually be respectful of your direct report's time, you didn't just have control over it. You had to actually earn the right to have them come to your meeting. It changes the whole dynamic of how a whole organization works. The other thing we do is we think about the size of teams in order to speed things up. So this is an Amazon concept, but Facebook believes it as well. It's this idea of two pizza teams. You should never have a team that's so big it can't be fed with just two pizzas. And it's a really frustrating world to live in, let me tell you. You never feel like you have enough resource, resources. You feel stressed all the time. But two pizza teams move faster. They make decisions. If they're given autonomy, they make decisions faster. They move quicker. They are less wasteful of resources. They focus on impact. They're a much better way to keep moving forward. And even today, Amazon, Facebook, Google always, always try to structure two pizza teams. And these are the other things that we do as well, right? And a lot of this is getting wound up in this agile uh, this agile movement that we're all hearing about. But there's a reason we do this. The reason is to kind of create this sense of speed and keep everything moving and make sure that we always have that hustle. You know, we're moving faster than seemingly required. Let me unpack another one, data dexterity. There's no question, as leaders, we all need to be good at a lot of things, but being good at data is going to be the one of the new things we need to all be good at. And this is how I would define it. It's applying data analytics to all kinds of decisions that you make in your business, right? The small ones, the big ones, the medium ones every kind of decision. And it's really important because the type of work we're going to do in the next few years, and you may have seen some other slides and presentations on the same topic, because then it's changed. It's a piece of work, again, with McKinsey that I was involved in, where it's the question is, how much is work going to change with automation and AI? And McKinsey added up all the hours of work done in across, I think it was 14 different developed nations, and tried to figure out, this is just a volumetric measure of, how's the hours work going to shift over the next few years to 2030? And basically, the hours that we're spending doing physical stuff and lower cognitive stuff are going to decline, and the hours we're going to spend doing the higher cognitive and technical stuff are going to go up. And that's, that's been happening just the past few years. It's going to continue. So the lower cognitive stuff's not going to disappear, and the manual stuff's not going to disappear, but there's going to be a big shift just in the next few years. So what does that mean? Over on the right-hand side, we're going to have to be a lot better at data and working with machines and understanding how, how we use data to make decisions. And so there's a few things a data dexterous leader needs to know how to do. And these are those. Asking the fundamental questions about how you use data. You know, why, wh what, what is this tool, the tool in my toolkit? How do I apply it, these new tools that I have access to? How do I figure out how to collect it and generate it and organize it in my business and understand how that gets done? Making sure I'm top of that. Making sure that I, can, I know how to develop the skills and insights to drive, uh, so the, the skills to drive insight that is in the data we collect. Do we, do we build it internally? Do we outsource it? Do we partner with somebody else? There's going to be lots of different ways to make this happen. And then finally, we need to change the processes to make sure that data is on tap, ready for decision makers. We need to build the, the data dexterous leaders in our business, but then we need to give them the tools so they have them on tap to make those decisions in real time. They don't have to scrap around for the data for two weeks before they can make a decision. But we also need to change mindsets because that's going to be a big shift as well. There's four things I'd, I'd emphasize here. One, we have to focus a new on talent and the type of talent we bring into our business, those uh, Einsteins and the youth that I spoke about, and in integrating them with machines. We need to rethink all of our business processes that were built in the 19th century and get rid of the ones that don't work and retool the ones that still do work to make sure that we're good for the 21st century. We need to continue to test and experiment and learn, this sort of fail fast, fail quickly, this whole mi minimal viable product concept. You know, it's not creating this whole idea of sort of long waterfalls of technology development is gone. You know, we need to move fast as business, create products every day, create new features every day, test them every day, learn every day. And then we need to make sure that we calibrate our investments accordingly, right? Sort of, and, and be very nimble in terms of how we can allocate capital and very, very quick at doing that. We can't have these long capex cycles that businesses are so used to. And let me f unpack this final third one, this customer obsession point that I made earlier, particularly about Qantas. This is the combination of data insights, obsession, and paranoia that that leads to continuously better customer options. Continuously better is the key phrase here. And this is the way we thought about it at Facebook. 
when we went to bed, uh, if, you know, whenever we went to bed on a Monday and we got up the Tuesday morning, we would say, you know, the customer experience or the user experience that we had last night when we went to bed is not good enough today. Today it's got to be better again and better again and better again. And even if you look at the development of Facebook over just the past couple of years, you will not notice sometimes big changes, but often just subtle changes going on in your news feed all the time. So one subtle change that was a shift just over the past few years was how the camera and video became much more prominent in Facebook and in Instagram over the past few years. Because we realized that, that players like Snapchat, who are very camera first, they actually were doing very clever stuff that we were behind on. So redesigning re Facebook to actually be more customer focused around the camera and around video was something really important. And this came from this obsession and this paranoia. And we have this construct at Facebook where we put the customer at the center and data informs everything, but we are obsessed the way I gave the Qantas example. You know, we're not, we don't stop. We think, no, if we're not solving this problem, somebody else must be solving it. You know, somebody in China is solving it. Somebody at Google is solving it. Somebody at Snapchat is solving it. And we're also paranoid. Right? We're worried that uh, you know, if we, it goes beyond obsession, we're worried that somebody's going to crush us. It's going to take and eat our lunch, that we're going to disappear. And we're focusing on this question of friction all the time. We're focusing on this question of curation. How do, you, how do we bring data to a customer at a key point in time to add value to, to their experience? Facebook does it through your newsfeed. Every time you open it up, it has the most recent relevant stuff in your newsfeed. Google does it when you search. In Google, it gives you the best, most relevant result. Amazon does it by if people who bought this also like that which is a super simple but super powerful and usually valuable intention engine and recommendation engine for Amazon. These are the way that those businesses curate this kind of data. And the paranoia piece, I can't emphasize enough. This is actually the, if you go to Silicon Valley, you visit Facebook's headquarters. Um, and if you go to Apple, you go to Google, you can get your picture taken out the front. I've done it, I've done it all, the big, the big, tele, the, um, the big telecom, sorry, telecom, the big Silicon Valley businesses. But this is Facebook. You go and you see the sign out the front. But what's more interesting is if you walk behind the sign, because this is what you see. The original 19 buildings that Facebook sits on, uh, the original campus, it was an old Sun Microsystems campus that Facebook just retrofitted. And when we moved in, Mark himself said, hey, don't replace the sign, just turn it around. So the scratched and rusty Sun sign is the one that faces in the Facebook. When you look out the window from Facebook, that's what you see. And for those of us old enough to remember, Sun Microsystems was the biggest company in Silicon Valley in the 1990s, the biggest IPO in history, $200 billion market cap, which was huge. Back in this day, I think it was one of the top five biggest companies in the world. By 2004, 2005, it had fallen on hard times and had been acquired by its arch nemesis, Oracle, which was the, the, fate, the fate worse than death for Sun Microsystems. And so Facebook keeps this as their reminder of paranoia, which is, you know, we... There was once a company here that thought they were unbeatable, and they are gone today. They're a footnote. They're the scratched and rusty sign, and we could be the same and just at any time if we missed the ball. So my message to everyone is this game has changed, right? And we have to change ourselves. We all have to think about how do I retool myself as a leader? How do I retool my team? How do I retool my business to be successful in the 21st century? And we were all trained in the 19th century, and we don't want to throw all that away, but we need to adapt these new capabilities for the 21st century in order to be successful. I want to thank you very much for your time, and the drinks are out there. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Stephen. I might just um, let you stay there. Have we got any uh, questions for Stephen about his uh, very exciting presentation? Are you, shall, I, shall I point him out? You're going to point him? Yeah. You point him out. Okay. Thanks. It's Tim Wildash from Next. Hi, Tim. Um, while you're at uh, uh, Facebook, you, you would have understand the global uh, philosophies of uh, those major businesses, and particularly on Amazon. I think they operated here for over 12 years before they paid any tax at all, whereas their competitors in Australia were paying payroll tax, 30% corporate tax, and GST. What do you think would have happened to Amazon if they hadn't found that loophole in our democratic capitalistic world? Um, and not and dodge tax, you know, and uh, we don't have the hospitals, the police, the footpaths, the yeah. schools, etc. Yeah. Can you comment on that, please? I hated this question while I was at Facebook. So, um, <coughs> let me see if I can give you a, an answer that satisfies. Um, so, one, and I'm no, I'm no defender of people shouldn't pay tax that they should pay. Everybody should pay the tax they should pay. And I'm not a tax accountant, so you know, uh, I hire smart people to uh, do my taxes for me. Um, 
But I'll say this. A lot of it comes down to how we organize capitalism in this world, right? And we've organized it, again, 19th century, right? Which is, hey, I've got a country here. It's got its operations here. I'll tax it here. That's not how a lot of businesses work today. So we need the 19th century ways of, of, of man, even managing taxation and managing ourselves as nation states needs to evolve for this new world. We can't simply say that you know, Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, these multinationals should be shut down. That's not progress. What we need to do is we need to catch up to how they operate and actually think of a way to, um, to, to, to have businesses pay their fair share in the places where they are actually are operating. So it's a complex question. Any, I had this conversation with the CEO of a business in another country who was very vocal in his criticism of Facebook. He was like, you know, Facebook doesn't pay enough taxes in our country and you should pay more taxes here, more taxes here. And I sat with him at one point and I said, look, I was a little facetious, but I was actually serious. I said, look, I've looked through your annual report and nowhere in your annual report do I see a line that says that you um, voluntarily pay taxes in a country you didn't have to pay taxes in. And if you did have that line in your annual report, I wouldn't be talking to you because you would have been fired. A board and a, lead, a CEO is not incentivized to pay taxes in a country where he does not have to pay ta he or she does not have to pay taxes, right? It's, we, need to get, we need to bring the laws up to, up to where these businesses compete. So um, that's sort of my broad answer to that question. Um, the second one is, you know, the way we, I mean, the, I've had people smarter than me that know more about this than I do, but just the way we tax things, I, I think, needs to have a rethink. You know, look at a, a business like Amazon, right? Amazon's not a profitable business, right? So if your tax business is on profit, you don't get a lot of taxes from Amazon, right? So you need to rethink even the business model of Amazon. It sort of tends not to be a really taxable type entity. Mm -hmm. So we need to rethink that as well. But I agree, these are challenges, right? We want to fund uh, our schools and our police and uh, our social services. And, you know, that can't all rest just on individual taxpayers. Business has to pay a fair share. Great question. Thank you. Just over here on your right, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Colin Ware from Moroku. Uh, just want to tie a couple of things together and see if you can give us an answer. So, a uh, bunch of conversations today about social media and if we look at WeChat, you know, moving into payments real fast, red envelopes, it's become a massive payments platform. The regulator talked today about the fact that um, lending's kind of easy, don't need a, don't need a license to, to lend and we're seeing lots of that. You know, the thing that the regulator really, really cares about is deposits. Um, so the kind of elephant in the room says, okay, so we can see social media moving into payments, that's today, tomorrow going into lending, doesn't look that far away. <coughs> what about deposits? How far off are we? Do the social media companies care about becoming a bank? Will they just skirt around the side of it and do everything they can do to stay in the un unregulated space and harvest well? Ah, uh, yeah, big question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, all, in all, all my time at Facebook, I never saw a Facebook strategic document that had any had financial services anywhere on it. You know, it didn't have particularly deposits. There was no, uh, hey, this is part of our five-year plan. So I never saw it. That doesn't mean it didn't exist, or it doesn't mean it hasn't been brought in. But I'd make two observations about financial services in general and the big, uh, some of the big tech companies. So one is the big tech players want to avoid regulation. What is it? What's what is financial services? It's heavily regulated. So you, you pretty much don't put up your hand by, you know, if you buy a bank or you go into deposits or you volunteer to be regulated over here, you're kind of saying, I'm, I'm happy to be regulated over here. And it wants, they want to avoid that. So that's one thing. Um, so I think that's a break on how quickly they go into any form of financial services. Second is they've got much higher margin opportunities in many areas today that they still haven't fully mined. So Facebook still has a lot, a long road ahead to, you know, look, its growth rates are still in the, I can't, uh, the latest time you're 50, 60% year on year, right? That's just advertising, right? So they've, those growth rates still have a long way to go before they stop mopping up all the inefficiency that exists in advertising. Now they need to start diversifying and start to build other ways of linking into particularly business. And clearly, um, thing, financial services are a oil that runs business and you can kind of make, you make an argument to say, well, if you're gonna be my everything platform for other, you know, advertising and e-commerce and, you know, in logistics, I might as well give you your, your transaction account and your credits and your, you know, which, um, which Amazon already does for its suppliers in the U.S. Uh, and a on a smallish scale. So I think there's, there's that movement, but I don't think there's a headlong rush f for the tech giants to go into FinServe, but the day will come. The day will come. I don't think the day is there in the next five years, but I think the day will come. 
But I think by that time, the banks will be in a very different uh, headspace and world themselves, deciding to figure out how they're going to compete. Because banks can compete. I mean, there is something about trust and being in a community and, you know, and, you know we shouldn't forget there's, there's a lot of... Deposit accounts are one thing, but there's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of... Your life is tied up in so, much, so many parts of your financial existence that, you know, I, I, I truly believe that, you know, the, the banks have a competitive advantage over the tech giants in this area. And over the next few years, I think they'll get their act together and, and exploit that competitive advantage. So I would I'd wait five years. I'll come back in five years, and then we'll have a more, <laughs> we'll have a more painful conversation. Any other questions? You guys are asking the tough questions yeah, here. They I thought are. I would get, like, what's Mark's favorite food or something? <laughs> you get a hard question. Right here. Uh, just a question on digital ID, which came up earlier in the day. Um, if you look at something like Amazon, you're actually buying something, you're actually purchasing something. So the, the account is almost certainly in the name of a real person. But it's been in the news over the last few years about how many fake accounts there are in Facebook and the various social sites. So it seems from a banking perspective impossible to, to take uh, Facebook ID as being in any sense a real ID. But where is Facebook or, or any of the other social sites going to go in terms of validating and verifying real IDs for people? Um, interesting question. Um, I can't, probably can't speak for most of the social sites. I'll say this about ID, uh, what you just said before about uh, fake accounts. I, I think the truth is when you really look at it, the number of fake accounts on Facebook is infinitesimally small. The AI is very good in Facebook. One of, the, one of the things AI is very good at is removing fake accounts on Facebook. Twitter has a lot more problems with it because Twitter is not a, a, an authentic identity platform. It's a, you can have pseudonyms on Twitter. Um, and so it's much easier to have fake accounts on Twitter. It's a lot harder on Facebook. It is very difficult. And so it's a very, very, very small percent of the two billion people on Facebook would be fake accounts. So I would challenge that, that one statement. Um, but this is not the same as you know, a 100 point uh, editing check. I understand that. Where are they at with that? Um, the truth is I don't know. At Facebook, it probably wasn't a topic that I was really closely involved in discussing, but I would imagine that there is a movement. Th there will be some point in different jurisdictions around the world to have a, a second and third party verification of people's identity um, in, in terms of a 100-point style check, if that is something, particularly if you're going down the path of deposit accounts, only where that has to happen, right? You know, to get a social media account, you need to be 13 years old. And you have to say that you're 13 years old. Now, Facebook is very good at eliminating people who are younger than 13 years old. It can, the AI figures that out and will remove those accounts. But you don't have to show anything to get that account. Um, that's not going to be the true when you're going to other levels of, uh, you know, so uh, if, you, if, you want a, if you want a deposit account or financial services. Um, but I think it's an interesting question about this whole question of what is identity to begin with and what is your digital identity and how you carry it forward. And right now we're... I think we're going to look back on these days as very kind of um, primitive because we all don't have a sort of, our sort of blockchain approved unique ID that I can port from one service to another. And I, I look at the analogy of, let's go, you go back to the days of, uh, the, the, the early days of um, mobile phones. Remember when your mobile phone number wasn't portable? If you changed providers, you had to change your phone number. Remember what a pain that was? And then suddenly, you know, there was a portability was brought in. You could, you could keep your number no matter what, who your service provider was. I think we're sort of in the same primitive age of data identity right now where we have very primitive ways of thinking about what my identity is. Eventually, I think we will have unique identities that we just carry with us around the, the net that are, you know, that have blockchain you know, security all around them. So, good question. Thank you. These are all tough questions, guys. <laughs> I, I wanted the easy, the softball. We've got one more tough question for Steven. Right here. So I'm just asking a question about um, where facial recognition might be going. I just noticed, you know, on Facebook, you put a photo up. 99% of the time, it's right when it's guessing who it might be. So I just thought on that conversation around 100 point checks. Um, that sort of seems like last year's. I'm just interested to know your thoughts around 
how else we might be doing those um, and being really trusting and, and comfortable about <coughs> how we identify each other. Yeah. Well, that always ha already happens with those smart gates at uh, immigration, right? When you come through, it's, it's facial recognition. And it just matches it, I assume, it matches it with your passport and a couple other data points and you stroll right through. And the truth is, it was, it was actually facial recognition even before SmartGate. When you go to the immigration official, what do they do? They look at the passport, they look at you. It's facial recognition. Right? That's, and then they, they do scan it. But we've, had, we've been using facial recognition for a, a thousand years, right? To identify somebody. A penguin can recognize its mother by you know, looking at its face. Um, going forward, will, will your face be your unique identifier? I, I think it depends on where we go as a society in terms of whether we're comfortable with that or not. Um, we've had, you know, you see these, you see these swells back and forth with identity. Um, when I first came to Australia, there was that Australia card debate back in the 80s that can, got scrapped. And recently, there's been this debate about, you know, in, individual medical uh, records and, you know, how that gets uh, aggregated up. And it, you know, you can see that, you know, different parts of, of, of society in the community have different reservations about uh, how much of their data is is available to others and, and then the rules and regulations around that. I just think we don't have enough, I don't think we have enough thought that's gone into this as a community. Regulators, politicians are one thing, obviously, but I think as a community we need to put, have these conversations as well. The question you ask, I don't have a simple answer for. Um, and I use an analogy for this actually as well. Think about, just think about your identity for a minute, okay? Hold that here. And now think about this analogy. If somebody walks into your house and you leave the door open or the door's unlocked and they go in and they take your toaster and they walk out the door with your toaster, right? If I asked everybody in this room, is that a crime? Would everybody agree? Or pretty much everybody agree, yeah, that's a crime. It's, it's, you shouldn't, it's a thing of low value. I left the door open, right? Very low value. I left the door open. Uh, but somebody, sh and so we have a community standard that says, yeah, that's a crime. Yeah, it's legally, if you go look at the law, it's a crime. But none of us, most of us don't, haven't read the, 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 the legal statutes, we just know that's wrong. But if I, if I give you the, the, the equivalent from your data and your identity point of view, let's say you're driving down the street and a camera takes your picture, right? Who has rights to that, that image and that photograph, right? And to, and to that identity, who has rights to it? If I asked uh, you know, 100 people in this room, we wouldn't all agree. We would get probably, you know, we'd get dozens of different points of view. Yeah, it's okay if it's the police, it's okay if it's used in one way, no, it's not okay at all. It depends on who took the picture, it depends on how long, you know. And so we, we live in a world where we don't have the same agreement around, this kind of toaster level agreement about how our data is used. But these conversations I think are good because we're getting, I think we're getting the community and all of us to start to have shared values about this. It could, it'll take years to get those shared values because it took that long with property rights. But I think with our digital property rights, we'll get the same thing. Excellent. Awesome. Yes, please uh, thank Stephen Sheila for Thank his you. Presentation.